evening i will good evening i welcome you all to our ninth session of palmocon 2021 on behalf of institute of palmocare and research and our organizing secretary dr partho sharoti bhattacharya our today's topic is non tubercular mycobacterial lung diseases and on this session we are having a chairperson dr raja dhor who is a renowned pulmonologist in kolkata he has more than 27 years of experience in pulmonology critical medical management and interventional pulmonology his other areas of expertise uh, lies in orphan lung disease copd interventional diagnostic pulmonology and all he has remained a member of the governing body of icas and a major role in developing modules in icas curriculum he has also published Uh, several papers in peer reviewed international journals including the embark study from india now i would like to request our chairperson to kindly proceed over the session and introduce our speaker of today's session hello friends welcome to day 9 of palmocon my name is dr raja dhar i head the department of pulmonology at the ck bidla group of hospitals in kolkata i want to thank parthoda dr partho sharathi bhattacharya profusely for bringing these sessions to all of you it's been a learning experience when i've been a part of this meeting over the last few weeks today is special it gives me great pleasure to invite my friend and mentor a young giant in the field of pulmonology Dr James Chalmers James is going to speak today on non tuberculous mycobacteria Before I have the pleasurable task of introducing James let me give a brief introduction on the topic Being an Indian and being in India we've always known about mycobacterium tuberculosis Non tuberculous mycobacteria is a disease that's been less recognized globally and in india is a less recognized entity however the number of deaths from ntm disease have been steadily increasing globally these bugs were once thought to be environmental saprophytes which were only dangerous to individuals however ntm are now commonly infecting seemingly immune competent children and adults at increasing rates through pulmonary infection This is of concern because NTM is difficult to treat. Indeed, NTM has become extremely antibiotic resistant and now have been found dispersed through person to person contact. To highlight these factors and many more, we will have Professor Chamal speak to all of us about non tuberculous mycobacteria and then we will have a brief discussion with Dr. Parthi Bhattacharya. Dr. Chalmers is a leading UK lung expert, and over the last 20 odd months has treated innumerable patients with COVID-19. He's undertaken important. This is awarded every 3 years and is amongst the most prestigious international awards in the fields of respiratory medicine. This comes coupled with awards from the American Thoracic Society which proclaim his his devotion and the way he's made the specialty of respiratory medicine progress over the last few years. I present to you Professor Chalmers and the topic today is non tuberculous mycobacteria hello friends welcome to d9 dr james please thank you very much Um, and thank you to Dr. Bhattacharya for the invitation to speak to you today, uh, as well as to Dr. Dar for the introduction. 
Um, it is a great pleasure to be speaking to you about this topic. Um, Non-tuberculous mycobacteria are some of the most difficult um, respiratory infections that we face. Um, and so it's really great to be speaking with uh, all of you about this topic and sharing with you some of the challenges that we have with this, this clinical problem. Before we start, can I just check that you can see my slides at the moment? Dr. Bhattacharya, okay, yeah, are you able to good. see the slides? Yeah, yeah, we can see your slides. Fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to talk through um, the clinical problem of NTM, the diagnosis, and then some of the issues around treatment. And a lot of this will be based around the um, recently published Joint Societies, ERS, ATS, uh, IDSA, European Society of Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases guidelines that were published in the European Respiratory Journal um, just last year. So I would point you to those guidelines for more information about a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about. So in Europe, NTM lung disease has been classified for many years as a rare disease, um, but it has been increasing as a clinical problem over the past 10 to 15 years, uh, really in line with reductions in the rates of tuberculosis. So in my uh, practice in Scotland, we have very few cases now of TB each year. TB elimination is very close uh, in some parts of the UK, particularly the north of the UK where I practice. And so when we see a patient with suspected mycobacterial infection, nowadays it's much more likely to be NTM disease than it is to be tuberculosis. I'm showing here some data from Germany, which shows uh, a year on year increase in the rates of NTM infections over time and you can see in the green boxes are males in the uh, in the blue are females and the green is the overall trend and really it's increasing in both males and females uh, at a at a steady rate year on year now why is ntm increasing i suspect we're addressing some historical underdiagnosis of this problem i suspect some patients with severe lung disease are living longer uh, and therefore are more susceptible to NTM disease. And we're also using more anti-immune uh, system therapies, so more immunosuppressive therapies for autoimmune rheumatoid conditions, COPD, asthma, et cetera. So there's a whole range of reasons why NTM lung disease might be increasing. Treating NTM lung disease is really challenging, as uh, Dr. Dar said in the introduction. It's, these patients require prolonged therapy. The therapies are relatively toxic. Uh, and the patients often have severe underlying lung disease that makes their treatment more challenging. And so very much the guidelines and my own practice emphasizes the importance of the multidisciplinary team in managing these patients, uh, which is a pulmonologist or infectious diseases physician, but also input from pharmacists who can look at those important drug-drug interactions, the role of the microbiologist, the support for the patient through nursing and physiotherapy, uh, and the role of radiology, particularly around diagnosis, but also monitoring the disease. Um, so it's important to emphasize that uh, that important issue of the multidisciplinary team. So let's start by talking about the diagnosis of NTM lung disease, um, because not every patient that isolates an NTM has NTM lung disease. And we'll keep returning to this point uh, that NTM exist in, in water sources. So you can find NTMs in rivers, in streams. You can find NTMs in the sinks in your hospital or in your home. You can find them in your shower heads. Um, and they can very easily find their way into sputum samples, either through transient colonization of the airways uh, or through some of the reagents that we use in laboratories. So when you isolate an NTM from a, a clinical sample, it doesn't mean that that patient has an NTM lung disease. And so we have diagnostic criteria that have been in place since, two th since um, 2007 in order to classify patients into NTM lung disease or not. And they require the presence of radiological abnormalities, microbiological criteria, and clinical criteria. So we classify patients as having lung disease due to NTM or likely due to NTM in the presence of abnormal radiology that is likely to be due to NTM, and that can be uh, nodular bronchiectasis or cavitary disease, and I'll show you some examples of that in a moment. For the microbiological criteria, we require 
uh, at least two isolates of the same species uh, from non-sterile samples like sputum or one isolate from a bronchialveal lavage uh, because it's presumed that if that's a deep sample from a sterile or a largely sterile area, uh, it's likely to be clinically significant. The other possibility is that you can isolate NTM from a biopsy, in which case, again, a single isolate from a biopsy is likely to be clinically significant. And then the clinical criteria is that the patient has bronchopulmonary symptoms that are due or likely due to NTM. So a typical problem that we have is a patient with bronchiectasis who isolates a mycobacterium avium, for example, that patient has structural lung disease, and so it's difficult to know how much of the structural lung disease is due to the NTM. They will isolate the uh, NTM in sputum, so the microbiological criteria are possible to fulfill. But also, how do we separate out the symptoms due to their underlying lung disease and it, new symptoms that are related to the NTM? Um, we don't use bronchial villa lavage routinely in NTM patients because many of these patients can spontaneously produce sputum. And so it's much better to get several samples from sputum than to use the invasive test. So that's the diagnostic criteria of the three, radiology, clinical, microbiological. But there are other factors that feed into our decision as to whether an NTM species is important or not. And the species itself is very important. In my practice, the most common NTM that I see is Mycobacterium avium, followed by Mycobacterium abscessus. And on this uh, graph here, I've put those two most commonly isolated organisms uh, in, in bold because they're the ones that I see most often. But what this chart is showing is the percentage of patients who meet those IDSA ATS diagnostic criteria according to the different species that is isolated in the sputum. Uh, and going from uh, right to left, Mycobacterium kansatii behaves like TB. It causes upper lobe, typically cavitary disease. It almost always needs treatment. It almost always causes clinically meaningful disease. Um, so that's really important. Mycobacterium malmoense similarly is typically isolated in patients in my practice who have pre-existing cavitaries, uh, often from TB disease in the past. It's nearly always clinically significant and nearly always needs treatment. But as you go down this list, you see that around 60% of mycobacterium abscessus isolates are associated with clinical disease. Um, so not all abscessus needs to be treated, is what this shows. Um, some individuals will isolate abscessus due to contaminants or transient colonization of the airways. And mycobacterium avium is close to 50%. Uh, and I would say that this data, which is from um, a European study, fits with my own clinical experience, that I probably only treat 40 to 50 percent of my patients that isolate mycobacterium avium, because some of them don't have severe enough symptoms and some of them don't meet the criteria for disease. And then as we go down this uh, list, you find organisms like M. fortuitum, which occasionally does require treatment, is particularly associated with gastroesophageal reflux, by the way, uh, but often doesn't require treatment or clears spontaneously. And then Mycobacterium gordonii, which is one that we see frequently as a contaminant in the laboratory. Uh, and I have never treated a patient for M. gordonii lung disease, and I'm not sure I've ever seen a convincing case of M. gordonii uh, lung disease. So that is really important. As part of the, the diagnosis, we've got to think about how pathogenic is the species that the patients have. And then once we've decided that patients have clinically meaningful disease, we have to think about the phenotype and therefore the likelihood that we're going to need to treat these patients for this disease. In my practice, the most common phenotype of NTM lung disease that I see is the nodular bronchiectatic phenotype. So these are patients that present like a patient with non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis. Um, they often are elderly females with a cough, which may be dry or may be productive. And the chest x-ray, which is shown here, often shows relatively subtle changes, bronchiectasis, nodules, things that are not that easy to see on a, um, on a chest x-ray. And you really need a CT scan to fully uh, assess a patient with suspected nodular bronchiectatic disease. So if you look here, you see classic changes uh, associated with nodular bronchiectatic NTM on the CT, 
So the typical things you will see will be pulmonary infiltrates or consolidation, tree in bud pattern, uh, indicative of bronchiolitis, small nodules, uh, or cylindrical bronchiectasis. And the, the classic appearances are in the right middle lobe and the lingula, uh, which gives this appearance that is sometimes referred to as Lady Windermere's fan, uh, named after uh, a uh, an old play about someone that uh, is very fastidious and very careful. This is the the uh, the story here is that this was thought at one stage to be caused by uh, suppression of cough in women uh, who were being very careful and very uh, polite, and hence it was named after a play uh, where a character had similar tendencies. This is a much more florid version of the nodular bronchiectatic form. I mean, you can see on the on the left hand side of this slide, really much more severe bronchiolitis, uh, mosaicism, really significant nodular change, um, central lobular nodules uh, with bronchiectasis. And so this is a much more severe uh, form, but still without cavitation and therefore uh, classified as nodular bronchiectatic. Uh, uh, non-tuberculous mycobacterium disease. This is really very typical with mycobacterium avium. So species have different phenotypes. Um, and if you saw an appearance like this, I'd be strongly suspicious that this was mycobacterium avium uh, or abscessus. Now, the nodular bronchiectatic form can progress to cavitary disease if it's untreated, but in many cases it does not. So the fibrocavitary disease is uh, the phenotype that is associated with a greater severity of disease. And it presents in a very different way. It often presents in my practice to the TB clinic because it looks for all the world like the patient has tuberculosis. So the chest X-ray can show gross abnormalities, often in the upper zones, just like TB. Uh, it can also have evidence of traction, pleural thickening, uh, there may be bronchiectasis, there may be nodules, but the cavity, the cavitary nature of the lesions predominates. Patients are often more systemically unwell, uh, and this phenotype is more common in males, where the nodular bronchiectatic disease is more common in females. Uh, and patients often have a history of underlying lung disease, so they may have previous history of tuberculosis or a history of COPD. This is a CT scan now of the nodular uh, disease, and you'll recognize that radiologically, this is difficult to differentiate from tuberculosis. There's opacity in cavitation. The location is also the most common location with TB. The differences to TB, uh, and this is a very heterogeneous disease, so it won't always be as, as different as this, um, but the, the cavities are said to be more thin-walled with less surrounding opacity. Uh, disease is said to be less bronchogenic in NTM compared to TB. Um, and uh, these other features are meant to uh, suggest differences with TB. But in my experience, it's very difficult to look at a CT scan and say this is likely to be NTM or this is likely to be TB. These are more examples of really gross cavitation that you can see uh, in, uh, in fibrocavitary. Uh, NTM disease. And patients, as I mentioned, will present often as if they have TB. They may have hemoptysis, they may have fever, they may have all these other symptoms that are actually relatively uncommon in the nodular bronchiectatic form. So again, species are sometimes different. You can get this with M with M avium and M abscessus, absolutely. Um, but you would also think about M cansasii with this type of appearance, L ma M malmoense, um, other NTM. So we've made a diagnosis. We've decided whether our patient has the IDS AATS criteria for pulmonary disease. Uh, we've then phenotyped them into nodular bronchiectatic or fibrocavitary disease. The first steps then in managing are deciding how severe is this disease? How likely is it that this patient is going to progress if I don't give them antibiotic therapy? And so several of these things come through. So one is, is the disease positive by culture? And are they smear positive? Uh, that gives you an idea of the load of mycobacteria in the airways. Are there cavities? How pathogenic is the species? 
and what other things are going on because these patients often have other comorbidities that contribute to their disease burden uh, and uh, we'll return to that theme in a moment because the the key thing here is deciding because the treatment for NTM as you'll hear in a moment is treatment uh, with antibiotics for at least 18 months and typically for two years is the burden of treatment going to uh, be worth it in terms of the benefits to the patient and in some cases the answer to that question is no so you have to ask yourself how likely is this patient to suffer side effects from the NTM therapy uh, are there alternative therapies I could offer such as surgical resection that would solve this problem without chemotherapy is the patient going to comply with long-term therapy because non-adherence can lead to drug resistance and what other therapies is the patient taking that might interact with my NTM therapy? So let's talk about therapy for the most common species that we isolate in, in NTM disease. So as I mentioned in my practice, M Mavium is the most common thing that I see. Uh, and here we have some evidence uh, from observational studies and we have one randomized controlled trial uh, that addresses the issue of refractory disease. So the most common and the most widely used therapeutic regimen for anavium disease is rifampicin, ethambutol, and amacrylide with or without the addition of amikacin. And we add amikacin for patients that are smear positive or who have cavitary disease. And amikacin can be added either as uh, uh, intravenous amikacin at induction when you start therapy, or more commonly for my practice, inhaled amikacin uh, alongside the oral regimens. Uh, a small proportion of patients, maybe five to 10%, uh, don't uh, achieve sputum culture conversion by about six months. And those patients can be considered for refractory therapy. Uh, and there's a randomized controlled trial called the CONVERT trial that shows that liposomal amicacin uh, provides a higher likelihood of clearance of the bacteria uh, compared to control in refractory disease. So there's a role for, for liposomal amicacin there. So for M. cansasii, the most widely used regimen is, is rifampicin, isoniazid, and ethambutol, but you can also use amacrylide in this context. Uh, and the guidelines don't uh, express a preference for which you should use. Uh, I'm not going to go through M. xenopi, but the data are, are there. And M. abscessus is a particular challenge. M. abscessus is a really difficult NTM to treat. Thankfully, it's relatively uncommon in the non-CF population, but it is spreading amongst the CF population in Europe and North America. Uh, there's evidence of person-to-person -person transmission of M. abscessus in that population. Uh, and so for M. abscessus, we often do an initial induction therapy uh, using intravenous drugs like amicacin, imipenem, kefoxetim or tigacycline uh, and then uh, there's a continuation phase uh, where we give patients a combination of drugs uh, including uh, macrolide, clofazamine, linezolid, inhaled amicacin, often other drugs such as minocycline, uh, really whatever, whatever the uh, organism is sensitive to and the patient is able to tolerate. Combinations of drugs for M. abscessus are really challenging and required, require specialized input. So the treatment duration, according to guidelines, is you should continue therapy for 12 months after sputum culture conversion. Uh, with the exception of M. cansasii, where a fixed term 12 month treatment may be curative. Um, uh, M. abscessus disease, uh, often requires longer than, uh, longer than other uh, organisms because it's so challenging and surgery has an important role because uh, chemotherapy is so challenging surgery can help so we have really good guidelines for NTM lung disease and I've I've told you already about the IDSA guidelines and the Joint Society guidelines that were published in the ERJ just last year unfortunately adherence to these guidelines is really quite poor this is a survey that was published in the ERJ uh, it's a few years ago now, but it, I doubt it's improved very much, which shows the proportion of patients that uh, get treated with the guideline recommended therapy for mycobacterium uh, avium lung disease, which is rifampicin, ethambutol, and amacrylide. Uh, 
So you can see in Europe, it's only about 10%. In my own country, the UK, it's less than one in five patients. Japan is an outlier. They seem to be doing things right. But in general, patients are not treated with the, the guideline recommended chemotherapy regimes. And that's partly, I guess, to do with toleration, toleration of those regimes, but also poor awareness of the guidelines. Uh, what we do know is that if patients are able to adhere to the guidelines, they're more likely uh, to recover from NTM lung disease. They're more likely to clear the pathogen. And this is data showing that um, where the odds ratio for recovery from NTM lung disease was far better for those that were able to adhere to the guideline recommended treatment regimen. And for MAC, the macrolide in particular is absolutely critical to the efficacy of the regime. Uh, and so regimens that don't include a macrolide uh, or regimens that include a macrolide but don't include drugs that protect the macrolide uh, are particularly dangerous. Right, so what a, what's the outcome like for these patients? So the first thing to say is that the mortality rate for people with NTM lung disease is high. And that's partly because of the NTM lung disease and partly because of the underlying conditions that patients have. Uh, the mortality is higher with certain pathogens. So you can see there, uh, M. avium is right in the middle of this graph uh, with a mortality rate uh, over five years that's almost 50%. That's a really high mortality rate, but remember, it's quite a frail, uh, severe population. Uh, the highest mortality rate there is for N. xenopi uh, with lower mortality rates for those individuals that uh, grew non-clinically significant. Uh, uh, NTMs. So N M Xenopi seems to be associated with an increased mortality. But regardless of the NTM species, probably the most important predictor of mortality is the presence of cavitary disease. So cavitary disease is much more severe. Patients have much more systemic symptoms. And you can see from this Kaplan myograph um, that you're uh, five times more likely to die over a 12 year period if you've got fibrocavitary disease than if you've got nodular bronchiectatic disease. Um, so that's why the guidelines say with nodular bronchiectatic disease, you've got to think very carefully about whether you're going to implement treatment. For fibrocavitary disease, we almost always will initiate treatment because the outcomes, the mortality rate is, is really poor. Other important factors that predict uh, likelihood of having to initiate treatment are uh, whether the patient is smear positive. So that's an indicator that there's more mycobacterial load in the airways and therefore that patients are more likely to progress. So you're almost twice as likely to initiate treatment with MAC if the patient's smear positive. And so we factor that into the decision to treat or not as well. So to summarize all of that uh, together, we've got a number of different things to weigh when we're thinking about whether to initiate treatment. So if it's cavitary disease, very strong recommendation there to initiate treatment uh, for the patient. If the patient has other signs that they're systemically very unwell, so they have low body mass index, low albumin, raised inflammatory markers, severe symptoms, that feeds into my decision making as well. If they have species that you know are going to cause uh, severe disease, M. xenopi, M. cansaceae, and M. malmoense being the key ones, you're going to initiate treatment. On the other hand, if you've got M. avium or M. abscessus and you've got nodular bronchiectatic disease, you may watch and wait. And a typical thing that I will do is I will talk to the patient about the risks and benefits, we'll decide we're going to wait. I'll see them three months later with a repeat CT scan and see whether their symptoms have progressed and whether their radiology has progressed. And if they haven't, we can carry on watching and waiting and seeing whether that NTM uh, actually just goes away spontaneously with their airway clearance. So microscopically positive patients are more likely to be treated. That's the smear positivity. That's not an absolute you must or you mustn't treat, uh, but it's part of the equation and then you've got to think, how easy is this going to actually be to treat? And resistance profile comes into that. So when you're thinking about treatment, you should get a, a resistance profile on your uh, mycobacterium avium or abscesses or whatever it happens to be. And for MAC, the macrolide resistance uh, 
has to be done. Because if the macro, if it's macrolide sensitive, it's much more likely to be cleared. You're talking a 60 to 70% likelihood of sputum culture conversion, so cure, if they're not macrolide resistant. If they're macrolide resistant, that goes down to 20 to 30%. And so your decision to treat in a macrolide resistant case is really, really difficult because you may treat somebody for a long time and not achieve culture conversion. And for M. abscessus, it's absolutely important to get uh, resistance testing against clarithromycin, amicacin, uh, cafoxetum, and it's also very helpful to have resistance testing against these other uh, antibiotics in order to be able to develop uh, a combination that's going to work for that patient. Uh, and so the final comment is what I've already said, which is that for many patients with nodular bronchiectatic disease, the right answer is to do nothing and to see what happens to that patient in terms of the progression of their disease over time and treat patients that have a deteriorating trajectory. Uh, I'm going to skip over this in the interest of time. So the, um, the IDSA-ATS guideline recommended uh, treatment for MAC is azithromycin, rifampicin, thambutol. Uh, and the decision then is between three times a week or daily therapy. Uh, and for patients that have nodular bronchiectatic disease, I typically use three times a week therapy. Uh, because it's been shown to have similar response rates uh, and it's better tolerated. For patients that have severe disease, so they've got cavities, they're smear positive, or uh, I'm having to treat them also with amicacin, uh, I would use daily therapy. Um, so this is the daily regimen uh, for the, uh, and the uh, additional therapy for patients that have severe disease. So for patient, patients that have severe disease, it's the combination of the three oral drugs plus consideration of either IV amicacin or inhaled amicacin. And increasingly, I use inhaled amicacin uh, because IV amicacin is, is uh, toxic. Uh, and think about whether there may be a role for surgical resection in these patients. If a patient... Uh, fails to clear their mycobacterium avium after six months of guideline-based treatment, they are categorized as refractory. Um, thankfully, this is only 5 to 10% of patients, but they can be the most serious and most difficult patients that we treat. There are few effective therapies in this population. Uh, there is the option of switching drugs within class in order to try and get greater penetration of drugs. Um, that, in my experience, is rarely beneficial in this case. If a patient's on intermittent therapy, they should certainly be converted to daily therapy. Uh, we sometimes give patients parenteral aminoglycosides, so the patients will come in for a period of uh, intravenous amicacin. Uh, there's always, if possible, a role for surgery. Uh, you, it doesn't even have to be curative once we get to refractory disease. Sometimes it's just about debulking uh, areas of disease. But the the intervention that has the best evidence, because it's a randomized controlled trial, uh, is the introduction of liposomal amicacin. Regardless of what you do, the response rate in refractory disease is low. And so you need to have very careful discussions with patients uh, to explain that the likelihood of a positive outcome in refractory disease is low. Very quickly, M. abscessus lung disease. So this is intrinsically resistant to a lot of uh, antibiotics. Uh, we divide the M. abscessus into those that are macrolide sensitive and those that are macrolide resistant. And again, macrolide sensitivity is associated with a much greater likelihood of cure. Uh, but for some patients with M. abscessus lung disease, it's not possible <clears throat> to achieve uh, culture conversion. And you're talking about 60% maximum success rate with guideline-based therapy. Um, and this is the evidence for that. So this is a series of cases of M. abscessus lung disease, uh, one from Canada, I believe, where overall only 50% of patients achieved culture conversion after two years, and one from South Korea where there's a 60% culture conversion rate. So you need to know this and you need to have this conversation with your patient to say, I'm going to give you a lot of drugs, uh, but there's only a 50-50 chance that we're going to achieve uh, culture conversion at the end of this. Uh, and patients need to be properly informed when they're making that decision to take therapy. Uh, I don't need to tell you much about monitoring uh, 
of antimicrobacterial drugs because I suspect you all treat patients with TB, but all of these drugs have substantial side effects. And so a key part of therapy is monitoring for those side effects for following up the patients to ensure that they don't come to harm from the therapies that we're giving them. I've already spoken a bit about drug susceptibility testing, so I won't go through this in great detail. Um, it is useful for some uh, antibiotics against some organisms, but for many, uh, it's the, the breakpoints are not established and therefore it's not particularly informative. For MAC lung disease, it's really about macrolides and amikacin. For an abscessus, it's very, very useful actually um, to have susceptibility testing. Um, so that's my recommendation is to at least get macrolide susceptibility testing for MAC uh, and to get widespread susceptibility testing for M abscessus. Um, and I'll skip over this because I've I think I'm running out of time. Uh, that's my final slide. So the overall summary is that uh, NTM is an incredibly challenging clinical problem. There are guidelines. Most of them are based on expert opinion. Uh, most of them are based on our clinical experiences of managing these difficult infections. Uh, the most difficult decisions are when to treat. And so you've got to think very carefully about do I embark on treatment? And then the selection of appropriate therapies and ensuring patients are safe uh, over, an, over a, uh, what's usually a two-year period receiving these therapies by doing appropriate monitoring. Um, so with that, I will hand back to our chair uh, for the case presentation. Thank you, James, for such a wonderful presentation and your journey from the beginning to the end was uh, fantastic. So I'm taking charge of Dr. Raja since he's uh, uh, busy in some other um, uh, important thing. He cannot join, but he, is, uh, he cannot take the charge. Uh, let me um, decide that uh, we have a case to present and I can see a few questions have already erupted. So I think we should go to the case first, then we'll take all the questions together. So it will be nice if you can stay with us for another, say, at most half an hour. So to present the case, may I request Dr. Raja, uh, Dr. Shudeep Ghosh from the Institute of Palmo Care and Research. This is a real world problem and um, it's a long story. We have made it short. A lot of things are not spelled out, uh, like uh, uh, assessment of the side effects of the medication detailed duration of the medications, but you can have a glimpse of it from the presentation of Dr. Ghosh. Sir, I'm sharing my screen, sir. Dr. Ghosh, please. Yes, I'm sharing my Yes, it has come. Yes, sir. Please continue. The screen is, yes. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. P.S. Bhattacharya, sir, for giving me this opportunity to present this case in Palmocon 2021. This is a, this is a 18 year long story of a patient who suffered from NTM disease. Sir, please make it full screen, sir. Okay. Now it's okay. Huh? This is a long, 18 year long story of a patient who suffered from NTM disease. First, 51 year old female from West Bengal first presented on 2003 with cough and intermittent sticky hemoptysis for one and a half years. On clinical examination and routine investigation, there was no abnormality, but CT scan showed some obvious abnormality in right middle lobe. At that time, clinician or physician thought about some infectious lung disease. So he, she was evaluated with sputum and bronchoalveolar lavage fluid for all microbiological uh, uh, testing, including microbacterial culture. Everything was negative. 
and she was treated with a short course of antibiotic and some other supportive treatment and she improved at that time again she presented in 2005 with moderate hemoptysis and significant weight loss at that time hrct showed middle lobe bronchiectasis sputum ab on staining on three occasion was negative and sputum microvectorial culture was short fought but no result was available and the prescription notes that she was started with empirical anti ntm therapy with consent at that time she was given she was treated with ethambutol levofloxacin azithromycin and as per the clinical records patient improved clinically symptoms subsided and gained 7 kg weight within 11 months so i cannot see your slides moving dr ghosh yes sir. i'm not sure is it are you moving your slides or are you talking on the same slide no sir i'm moving my slide okay please go on there may be some problem with my computer please no sir it's the slides are not moving sir oh. okay okay so i am just just a minute now its uh, slides are visible no sir not visible sir not yet yeah it was visible in between sir current still is not visible huh? Mm -hmm. Not visible. So, by the time you fix your slide, may I ask James a question? Yes. There are a lot of questions in the uh, in the chat box. One question is: uh, Is there any early provision of early diagnosis through PCR? um unfortunately at the moment the answer is no so i think those tests will be coming soon um but at the moment it's still the old fashioned um standard tests uh, there are various companies that are trying at the moment to develop rapid tests so pcr based tests for things like mac and, ab and abscesses but they're not used in my practice or in in any of my colleagues practice that i'm aware of okay thank you sir. Okay, I think Dr. Ghosh is back. Dr. Ghosh, please carry on. Yes, sir. So, yes. Yeah, now it's moving. Yes, sir. In Dr. Ghosh, you might want to make Dr. Ghosh, you might want to make this full screen. It's not full screen. That's okay. why you get now. Okay. It's okay, sir. Okay, okay, carry on. I think you have some problem. Anyway, if it is moving. Two thousand five, she again presented with moderate hemoptysis for three days, with significant weight loss, and HRCT showed middle lobe bronchiectasis. At that time, sputum AB was staining was negative on three occasions, and sputum microvectorial culture was short for, but no result was available. But as per clinical record, she was treated with anti NTM therapy after proper discussion and consent with patient. She was treated with ethambutol, levofloxacin, and azithromycin. she improved clinically uh, and gained 7 kg weight within 1 11 months but she discontinued treatment in november 2005 the slide is not uh, moving again okay please please dr ghosh she lost follow up from 2006 and in between 2005 december 2005 and 2009 she had occasional cough and mucopurulent expectoration but again uh, this period but again she visited our doctor in 2009 only in 2009 she presented with significant weight loss and recurrent hemoptysis and history suggestive of allergic rhinitis ct scan was suggestive of 
right middle lobe bronchiectasis and some lingular infiltrations and lingular bronchiectatic changes. Suta mycobacterial culture in that time was negative, but see again treated with and empirically anti NTM therapy, which was started in April 2009 with azithromycin, ciprofloxacin, rifampicin, and ethambutol. This time she was treated uh, for one year and she again discontinued treatment in April 2010. And next time she presented in our OPD with hemoptysis and right side adjustment for one month, sputum mycobacterium. Uh, sputum culture, mycobacterial culture grown mycobacterium abscesses complex from two, sp two sputum specimen and she was started with clarithromycin, ciprofloxacin, amicacin and doxycycline. In March 2015, she, she, her sputum became mycobacterial culture became negative. So at that time we planned for another 12 months of treatment but subsequent mycobacterial culture again came positive for NTM so treatment continued. The X-ray serial X-rays in 2015 and 2016 uh, showed that there is a persistent uh, changes in bilateral lower zones, uh, but sputum mycobacterial culture in August 2016 became negative. But that time CT scan showed there is a progression of lesion, so bronchoscopy mm -hmm. and bowel fluid analysis was planned, and bowel fluid again grown some. NTM within rapid uh, within 10 days and species as identified as a mycobacterium abscesses. This time, uh, drug sensitivity also done, and but in view of a recurrent uh, NTM infection and persistent growth of mycobacterium abscesses in respiratory sample, with sensitivity to all drugs she had been getting already, a second opinion was sought. She remained clinically stable. All, uh, and the plan was to stop treatment and to rehabilitate after uh, stopping all drugs after one month. Accordingly, her treatment was stopped in January 2017 and sputum mycobacterial culture in March 2017 came negative. Uh, she presented again after five months with a recurrence of hemoptysis and low-grade fever, but she denied any further investigations. <coughs> At that time, she was treated with cepodoxime, linezolid, amicacin, and ciprofloxacin. And after four, uh, getting four months of treatment, she improved symptomatically and discontinued her cell. Next, she presented our OPD in May 2021 with cough, fever, and hemoptysis for 15 days. This time, sputum culture sensitivity showed growth of Pseudomonas originosa and managed with two weeks of antibiotics, gentamicin and ciprofloxacin. After two months, she again presented with cough and hemoptysis and CT scan was repeated and it showed there is a progressive bronchiectatic lesions in middle lobe and lingula. But this time, sputum culture sensitivity does not grow in any bacteria and sputum mycobacterial culture also negative after six weeks. But she continued to have intermittent mild to moderate hemoptysis up to the month of October 2021. But presently, she is very reluctant for further evaluation. So this is a summary of uh, um, uh, the case presented here. Uh, was treated in different uh, time from 2003 to 2021. But we faced many problems uh, during management of this case. Uh, this patient had grown NTM from sputum and valve fluid on several locations, but not always with symptoms. In 2014 to 2016, she has grown growth of mycobacterium abscesses more than single location, despite the culture report showing sensitivity with the agents she is treating. We were con uh, constrained by the real world diagnostic difficulties and occasionally with the patient's decision to stop drugs or to deny to be investigated. The last regimen with cepodoxime linezolid had very effective response and the patient remained well over three years. But we faced many problems, but a uh, few problems are like lack of awareness regarding NTM diseases. Uh, there are some real diagnostic issues. Uh, we do not have a referral center or authority on NTM disease. Uh, drug susceptibility testing is also, also a big issues in our setup. Uh, we are often over dependent on radiological features for diagnosis of NTM. And there is a uh, 
problem with decision uh, decisions and logistics and some of our questions are uh, <coughs> uh, these are some questions uh, what are the rapid diagnostic method or how reliable are they i think uh, we can stop here dr ghosh yes, yes so so thank you very much for your um, uh, very good presentation this is a uh, middle aged lady who has been suffering from uh, for last 18 years and uh, she had four or five spells of treatment of uh, earlier on suspected ntm and later on mycobacterium abscessus diagnosed as ntm uh, lung infection and uh, once diagnosed uh, even then she had uh, she had no symptoms but she continued to show growth of mycobacterium abscessus in sputum also in bronchialveolar lavage and that point of time that patient was uh, getting uh, susceptible drugs uh, and the patient continued uh, to have symptoms with a short spell of well being she had a relapse so this patient had multiple relapse of ntm infection possible ntm infection the initial part of the story is not very clear to us because the patient was treated outside but from 2014 onwards uh, we could track the patient story uh, fairly uh, okay and we can we know that the diagnosis is mycobacterium abscessus infection it is uh, what to call it is a treatment failure or, or a relapse because the patient had a 3 years plus symptom free period and after that the patient has been symptomatic again and from 2014 to 2018 patient had a symptom free period of quite for quite a good length of time on treatment and once it was stopped maybe for 5 months or 6 months she was asymptomatic after that she again showed uh, symptoms and again showed growth of mycobacterium abscessus and after 2018 she had another 3 and 3 years plus asymptomatic state so dr james what is your take on this story is it a relapse or a reinfection what to say and yeah, so, believe, yeah yeah so um great case thank you very much for presenting it so well um a lot of the problems illustrated here are also problems that i see in my daily practice and i recognize a lot of these issues in my patients as well abscessus is probably the hardest ntm that we have to treat and so i have many stories like this of patients that have not been able to complete treatment or have completed some treatment and then have a a relapse or a reinfection so we know from uh, quite a lot of the sequencing studies that have been done in the us and in south korea that in more than half of the cases like this where somebody has a a, a period where they're free of infection and then they have another infection that it's actually re it's reinfection with a new isolate of m abscessus rather than relapse of the original infection these patients have structural lung damage they have bronchiectasis which means that they're more likely to be reinfected with these organisms so for both mac and abscessus the reinfection rates are really quite high and so it's possible that that 11 month treatment that the patient had did did achieve culture conversion the sputum was certainly negative for a period and maybe they've been reinfected with a different a different strain of m abscessus um without sequencing it would be very difficult to prove that conclusively but that's what it looks like from the the story thank you the initial part of the story the patient had relatively normal lung only the middle lobe was affected mm. so otherwise she is an immunocompetent host um there is no background <clears throat> illness to to potentiate or promote the mycobacterium abscessus infection what do you take it do you think that she is you know is there any way um, what is your comment about it yeah so i see loads of patients like this so i see middle aged men middle aged women who present with just a little bit of middle lobe bronchiectasis no immune system problem no underlying lung problem um and you wonder how is it that this person has been infected with ntm we know from some studies that have been done in the united states that many of these patients carry subtle genetic defects in cilia genes or in the cystic fibrosis um transmembrane regulator uh, gene so the cftr gene so this the patients have underlying disorders mild disorders that mean that they're more likely to be uh, colonized with um ntm infection 
so I think I think that's probably what it's about. I think you probably need to have some susceptibility factor, which can be quite subtle, and then you need to have exposure to mycobacteria. And um, it's often the case that when people have looked in the homes of patients like this, they find lots of NTM in their shower heads, or they find that they have other water sources in the house that mean that they're regularly exposed to large amounts of, of NTM bacteria. And so that combination often explains why they've become infected. Do you think it should be a part of our practice to inquire farther in depth and go into the household and look for the presence of NTM in the shower or the possible sources? Mm -hmm. I think morning. it's very, yeah, I think it's very difficult to do that because we often don't have the the money or the microbiological um, set up to sort of do that, that kind of testing. What I do do when I take a history from a patient who I think might have NTM, I ask them about shower and, and bathing. I ask them about hot tubs. I ask them about gardening, which is another common source of uh, NTM, you know, because these a lot of these organisms live in soil as well as water. Um, I ask them about these sorts of things that mean they may be more likely to be exposed to NTM. Uh, and if you have a patient like this who is reinfected with NTM, that's when I start to think, well, maybe we should be looking into the shower systems or advising them to take a bath rather than a shower. Uh, and that's part of US guidelines, by the way. So in the US, they often advise their patients if they're uh, at high risk of reinfection to avoid showers as a common source of, uh, of NTM bacteria. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I've got one more question regarding this patient. You have seen the culture report. He, the bug was sensitive to almost all the drugs you, she was taking at that point of time, yet she had uh, grown again the bug. So what is your take? Is it the story of the regular in vitro versus in vivo sensitivity difference, or is it something else? Yeah, so NTMs are organisms that infect macrophages. And so they, as intracellular pathogens, are not exposed always to, this, to the same amounts of antibiotic that we think they're being exposed to. So even if you treat a patient with four drugs against which it appears to be susceptible in vitro, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will see effectiveness in vivo in the, in the human body because of the nature of the bug it grows uh, the way it grows, the way it grows intracellularly and how much drug gets inside the cell. Um, and so it's really frustrating that you can have a patient like this who's got a susceptible isolate to four drugs and you still know that the likelihood of success of the treatment is only between 60 and 70 percent. In a third of cases, they won't respond. Uh, and that's probably to, partly to, drew, to do with drug access to the intracellular compartment. Well, if I refer this patient to you for further treatment, what should be your course of action? <laughs> um, so I guess at the moment, does this patient have M. abscessus isolated from the airways? Because I saw they've got a they've got um, progressive bronchiectasis on the CT for sure, but at the moment, I don't believe they've got um, microbiological evidence of ongoing M. abscessus. Is that the case? Uh, right now, we didn't find last occasion the three mm -hmm. sputum culture were negative for any growth, but the patient is still symptomatic. Yeah, so this is a really difficult one. So um, the some patients with NTM disease will continue to have NTM disease, and sometimes the microbiology labs fail to detect it. Um, and so in those cases, we're quite aggressive with the investigation. So that would include doing a bronchoscopy, doing a bowel, uh, and potentially doing a biopsy if there's quite extensive um, uh, changes observed. On the other hand, we've got to remember that if a patient has had M. abscessus for many years, and now they've got severe bronchiectasis, if they then develop severe symptoms, that may be the M. abscessus, but it may also be the bronchiectasis itself. So does the patient also now have pseudomonas? or stenotrophomonas or other gram-negative organisms as a result of the bronchiectasis that are now driving a lot of their symptoms. Many of my patients are co-infected with pseudomonas and NTM, and so it's often necessary to treat the pseudomonas, and we get so focused on the NTM that we forget that, oh, they could also have these typical yeah. pathogens. Um, and so 
uh, that then becomes difficult because we don't really want to use macrolides and we don't really want to use inhaled aminoglycosides in those patients because you want to reserve those for the NTM. So I often will use things like inhaled colistin in patients with pseudomonas co-infected with NTM because I'm not then using or losing a drug that I would otherwise like to use for my, my NTM therapy in the future. So if you've got a patient like this where you can't find the NTM, speak to your micro lab and see, you know, are there any additional tests we could do or extended culture we could do in case the NTM is hiding, but also look for co-infections uh, with fungi or pseudomonas. So I haven't mentioned that yet, but also ABPA and aspergillus disease are very common in association with NTM. So your patients with MAC or abscessus, make sure you investigate them for aspergillus, make sure you do the serology for ABPA, because that's another common uh, cause of deterioration where you go, oh, it's not the NTM anymore. What is it? Ah, it's, it's actually now aspergillus disease. So I understand I will evaluate the patient accordingly. Suppose it comes all negative and she has got bilateral disease, she remains symptomatic. Is there any, any question of um, surgical resection of middle lobe serially um, and the lingula segment later on? Yeah, I, in this case, that? the disease is in this case the disease is quite bilateral um, yeah. and quite extensive, and so you really would have to resect, you know, both middle lobe. I suspect a a surgeon is not going to be very keen to do that. We do occasion, you know, if there's a is if there's a big cavity in one of the lobes, for example, we do sometimes do debulking of one lobe, even if you can't resect the entire disease. Um, because it's sort of become a sump of infection and needs to just be to be debulked. But looking at your specific patient, the disease is now quite extensive in both the middle lobe and the lingula, and I doubt there's a surgical option there. I think it's uh, I think it's medical option. Yeah, thank you. I think you are correct. We shouldn't go for such uh, in such patient for any surgical options. Yeah, very, very so extensive a... surgery is likely to have a lot of morbidity attached to it. So for, um, I mean, my question is followed by another question given by one of our audience. Is there any predilection for middle lobe and lingula lobes uh, for NTM, especially MAC infection? And if it is so, why it is? Yeah, so that, uh, so it definitely is. So you uh, almost invariably see MAC disease, but also to an extent M abscessus disease in the middle lobe and the lingulas. Uh, and so the, the the theory behind that is uh, to do with bronchial angles. So there's a couple of studies that have looked at this, that when you inhale particles into your lungs, goes into the lower lobes, the middle lobes, the upper lobes, the clearance from the middle lobes and the lingula is the most difficult because the angle of the uh, of the airways is such that mucociliary clearance is most difficult from those locations. And in some patients, particularly tall, thin patients, those angles are particularly acute, meaning that mucus clearance out of the middle lobe and the lingula is really quite difficult compared to the lower lobes, for example. And so one of the hypotheses for why it affects the middle lobe and the lingula particularly is that patients will inhale a large dose of mycobacteria. It will go to the, the entire lung, but it will be cleared by mucociliary clearance from the lower lobes, but not effectively from the middle lobes because of the, the anatomical location and the acuity of the angles. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but that's one, of the, that's one of the best hypotheses for why it so frequently affects the middle lobe and the lingula. And you're, you're talking like 70% of all NTM disease affects the middle lobe and the lingula. So it's really, really common and really sort of specific. This is nodular bron bronchiectatic disease, I should say. It is possibly the most plausible explanation of this middle lobe and lingual lobe selectivity. Yeah. There's one question, I cannot make it out the uh, meaning of it, how to select a definite regimen instead of trying one after another. This is by one of our audience. Uh, yeah. So that, that's a really difficult question. Um, so you're right. We should, we should avoid trying one after the other. Um, so I think... Most of us now practice that wherever possible, we'll give the guideline recommended regimen up front. So if it's MAC, we will give rifampicin, ethambutol, 
azithromycin with or without amikacin as your first option and try and maintain that through at least the first six months of therapy. Uh, if that's not tolerated, you're going to replace one drug with the best alternative. If you have a failing regimen, you really want to, rather than try one additional drug and one additional drug, you're better to add more than one drug to a failing regimen um, because generally you'll just induce resistance to that one drug. So adding one after another is not a good idea if you're struggling. It would be to really try and change things uh, by um, by altering the regimen radically uh, if if you're if you're dealing with refractory disease. Uh, and the other mm. thing is to think the other thing is to think about using inhaled drugs. So I use a lot of inhaled amikacin if I'm needing to add in something extra because the patient's refractory. Um, it's uh, it's an effective way of getting large concentrations of antibiotic into the airways. So it is a principle for tuberculosis that you shouldn't add a single drug to a failing regimen. So it also yeah. holds good for NTM. Also, for, also for NTM disease. Yeah. There's a very good question. It's a little different type. How important is biofilm-based secondary infections in chronic lung diseases? Yeah, what a great question. So uh, if we look in the lungs of patients with NTM disease, NTMs themselves can cause biofilms, particularly M abscesses. And so that's probably a big part of the persistent nature of M abscesses. Biofilms prevent antibiotics from accessing the organism. So that no doubt contributes to the problem of M abscesses persistence. Um, and then obviously, if you've got a biofilm, that can also support things like Haemophilus influenzae and Pseudomonas originosa, which also live within biofilms. So I think biofilms are a, are a major problem. Um, and that's why, um, that's why these infections are often very persistent. It's hoped in the future there may be some anti-biofilm therapies that may be available for these types of infections. In the meantime, I've mentioned already liposomal amikacin has been uh, made available for uh, NTM lung disease. And liposomes can penetrate into biofilms, which may be one of the reasons why it works for a proportion of patients where the rest of the disease is refractory. There is a very interesting question who starts with uh, uh, greetings to you, saying it's a very interesting talk. And he's uh, in favor of uh, asking you the preemptive resection of affected part in the early phase of treatment so that you can get rid of the infection at the beginning and you know your cure rate goes higher. Yeah, hello, hello, Dr. George. I totally agree with you. So if you've got, for example, M abscessus in a cavity in a single lobe, uh, and it's and it's localized and likely to be amenable to resection. I totally agree with you. You would be better to operate on that at an early stage than to potentially fail with an antibiotic regimen. And at a later time point, the disease is now so advanced that it's not amenable to surgery. So I mentioned surgery several times during my talk because uh, people often forget about surgery, but I always try and mention it a lot because. For the right patients, it's it's the best option. So if if you've got very localized disease, but it's an organism that's going to be difficult to treat, like M abscessus, surgery is a very good option because of uh, it, it avoids the inevitable difficulties and potential failure of antimicrobial chemotherapy. So I think a uh, very good point by Dr. George. Another doctor wants to know what is uh, if we can nebulize. Uh... The injection amikacin, is there any special adverse event or can we do it? Um, so, yes, yeah, so thank you. Um, so that's correct. So there's two ways of nebulizing amikacin. One is putting the injectable format into uh, a nebulizer. The other is the liposomal formulation that's been approved in the US and Europe. Um, and we use both of them. So the, the problems with it, the side effects are between 10 and 20% develop bronchospasm. So they get wheezy after they take it and they're not able to continue with it. Um, so that's important. We do a test dose while the patient's in hospital so that they, we check they're not gonna have that adverse event before they go home. The most common adverse effect with both the injectable and the liposomal amicacin is dysphonia. About half of the patients will develop a hoarseness of the voice. For that, it's worth stopping the drug for a few days or a few weeks and then restarting it because sometimes it goes away 
after a little bit of a drug holiday, but some patients will stop it because of the dysphonia. Um, cough is also a problem. Uh, and then there's the, although it's inhaled, some of the amikacin does get systemically absorbed. So this, you still have to uh, worry about the ototoxicity and the renal toxicity uh, as potential side effects in a proportion of patients who get amikacin, uh, even, even when it's inhaled. Having said all of that, it, it is really useful as a drug. Uh, it does seem to improve the success rate. And I use a lot of the injectable formulation of amikacin, particularly for M. abscessus. What is the duration of inhalation of amikacin? I mean, um, so, this, yeah. so it depends on the organism. It depends on the severity of disease. So for MAC, uh, I will either start by giving patients injectable amikacin and then move them on to long-term inhaled amikacin. So that would be at least six months. Uh, for some patients, I don't do the induction and I just give them the first six months of inhaled amikacin. So it's very much you know, dependent on the severity of the disease and whether you're also using systemic amikacin. If I use it for M. abscessus lung disease, I give it for the full two years. If it's part of my regimen for M. abscessus, I give it for the full duration because uh, the success rate is much lower with M. abscessus. And small question, what is the dose and what is the frequency per day? Is it once daily or twice daily? And which dose you give? Injectable so, amikacin, because we don't have so the liposomal it, available here. No, I, I, absolutely. Um, so it is, it's twice daily, and I'm trying to remember the dose off the top of my head. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can't rem I don't want to give you the wrong dose, so I can't remember exactly. No problem. So there is uh, another question about, is there a protocol of uh, doing uh, culture sensitivity at a certain duration? And when do you actually decide to complete the treatment? I mean, objectively. Ah, okay. Yeah. So objectively, when you decide to complete the treatment, it's 12 months after sputum culture conversion. So I do sputum samples. I ask patients to give sputum samples every month or at, at, at worst every three months during therapy. And so if they uh, then turn from positive to negative, from the point at which they turn negative and stay negative, we continue therapy for 12 months to reduce the risk of relapse. So that means in most cases, patients will be sputum culture converted by six months and they'll have completed therapy for MAC by 18 months, um, which is a long duration of therapy, but that's what the guidelines recommend. So the US and the European guidelines say 12 months from sputum culture conversion. Great. There's one idea. Uh, in our practice, we suspect if the sputum positive Sputum is positive for uh, mycobacteria in say illness and stain, and the gene export is negative. I think, uh, is it a circumstance where we should look for NTM infection? I think so, yeah. So if, if you've got, if, if it's AFB positive, but the gene expert is negative, you want to get a culture for NTM because it's very likely that that's going to be an NTM. Now, it doesn't mean that it's going to be a clinically significant NTM. It might be, you know, M. gordonii or another of those contaminant uh, organisms. But it's still important to know because if you tested the patient, uh, it must be uh, the patient must have symptoms. And so those symptoms might be due to NTM. So if you get that situation, I would definitely be looking to get a culture for NTM. See how popular you are. So many questions are pouring in. There is one more it's question from my, yeah. <laughs> from my friend. While I'm waiting for speciation, is there a general regime uh, which one can use in NTM infection and then modify once the species arrives uh, and there is no risk of waiting? That means can ah, you start okay. empirically pending the identification of the species? Uh, unfortunately, I wouldn't recommend that because... Um, the usually in NTM disease, you don't need to rush. I mean, that's the first thing to say. So usually in NTM disease, patients are stable enough. You can wait a couple of weeks for the results of the culture. Um, so the patients, typically the species, you need to know if it's MAC or you need to know if it's abscessus or M. cansasii. The treatments for those are very different. So, you know, you've, we've talked already about M. abscessus. You're going to be using multiple drugs. 
uh, if it's if it's MAC, you need to make the decision: is it going to be rifampicin, ethambutol, macrolide, and amikacin, or you know something else? So uh, the risk if you give the wrong regimen is that you induce resistance and you expose patients to toxicity. So in my practice, I always wait for the species to come back and then move quickly once I've got the speciation and ideally the antibiotic susceptibility as well. Is there any difference in mortality if, uh, between cavitary versus nodular NTB infection? Um, yes, absolutely. So that your mortality rate is five times higher according to the best studies if you've got cavitary disease. Um, so the five-year mortality rate if you've got cavitary disease is about 50%. So it's worse than many cancers. Now, that's partly because the patients that get cavitary disease often have severe COPD or previous tuberculous lung disease or other problems that would increase their mortality. But nevertheless, uh, cavitary disease is a really bad prognostic sign. So we're very aggressive with cavitary disease. In almost every case, you would start them on uh, therapy as soon as you've got the species back. Um, and you would use the, the most aggressive drug regimens, including things like IV amicacin in the case of uh, MAC disease, uh, or induction with things like IV amicacin and tigacycline uh, for M. abscessus disease. Uh, Dr. Sunny George has given one more question to you from what I gathered from your talk. You made a passing mention that WGS will soon be applied to NTM also. Is it right? Um, yeah, that's correct. So um, in, in many research studies now, uh, whole genome sequencing is being used extensively. Um, and it's also now being used clinically. So in the UK, particularly M. abscessus now goes for whole genome sequencing, which can help for things like drug susceptibility, but also for tracking potential patient to patient transmission. Um, so just like TB, where um, whole genome sequencing is now becoming part of the diagnostic uh, uh, regimen or the diagnostic process, whole genome sequencing of NTM is being increasingly used and I think is going to be really, really useful. Uh, I think where I mentioned it earlier is in the context of reinfection or relapse, and that's another case where it's, it's very useful to be able to know whether this is the same NTM that you're treating or it's a, or it's a reinfection or it's an in, a new infection. There's a question about non-pulmonary NTM infection in post-operative scars, especially after laparoscopic. If there is a instrument contain, contamination, possibly we get, uh, sometimes I also find cases uh, of post-op uh, NTM infection on skin and soft tissue. Would surgical exploration, debridement and drainage of the pockets followed by pharmacotherapy is the way forward or what is the what should be done actually in such patients yeah so so i would have to be honest and say i don't think i've seen a case of um of that in a surgical wound before um, we do see cutaneous um, ntms quite frequently in the uk uh, and there the treatment is yeah um for if you can remove the lesion that uh, that's ideal and then give anti antibiotic therapy, which is typically the standard antibiotic therapy that you would use if it was pulmonary infection. Um, so in this case, I don't. So I don't have much experience with with surgical wounds like this. But the general principles would be um, surgical debridement or removal of the infected tissue if possible, and then standard antibiotic treatment postoperatively uh, to reduce the risk of relapse. There is a concern about the uh, adverse drug reaction. Uh, do you have any message to us? Um, so yes, it's very common. Uh, it's very, very common to get adverse drug reactions to the kinds of drugs that we use. I feel like you are all probably the experts on this because you'll all be treating TB and you'll all be treating MDR TB every day in your clinical practice. So you'll be well aware of um, you know liver toxicity, ocular toxicity with thambutol, the kinds of things that we see frequently. Um, specific issues with NTM, I've already mentioned mm -hmm. amicacin, which isn't used much for um, TB, but is used a lot for NTM. The other one is the macrolide. So macrolide toxicity, uh, hepatotoxicity is a problem ototoxicity is a problem. So warn all of patients if they develop tinnitus to re report that because 
that's reversible if the patient stopped the drug, but becomes permanent if it um, if they don't stop it rapidly. Um, and the other one is prolonged QT. So if we're combining things like macrolides with other drugs, or we're combining, you know, in some cases with abscessus, we're combining macrolide with fluoroquinolones. There's a very high likelihood of prolonged QT interval, and so we have to monitor for that. Um, and sometimes it forces us to use different drugs. So be very, very careful um, around drug monitoring and toxicity. A pharmacist is invaluable if you have one in your team to monitor also for drug-drug interactions, which are a big problem. Is there any role of betaquinine uh, beta or delaminate in NTM, the latest two antitubercular drugs given for MDR? Yeah, so there is. So there's in vitro activity of these drugs against many NTM species. So they're starting to be used. Um, uh, Bedaquiline more so than delaminid, but I think as as we get more experience with these drugs in TB, they will likely to they're likely to be more applied in NTM disease because there is a need for additional drugs in NTM disease. So the the answer is yes, um, but neither of them are anything like first line for any of these uh, these NTM species. Uh, do you have a protocol of looking for immunosuppression in all your patients of NTM? detailed evaluation, including the common that we do for pulmonary tuberculosis as diabetes, HIV. What is your problem? Yes. So that that's, um, I feel like that's something that we probably should do, but we, but we actually don't. So we look for, uh, we look for diabetes um, and we look for, is the patient taking immunosuppressive drugs? If they're taking things like inhaled corticosteroids, we see whether we can withdraw those. Um, but we don't, routinely do HIV tests, perhaps we should, um, and we don't do any other uh, evaluations of immune function. Uh, there's been some studies into interferon gamma defects, and we did that for some time, um, but we've stopped doing that now. Um, so I feel like that's something we probably should do more of, um, and you may be ahead of us in terms of thinking about that and doing that. <laughs> The question is still pouring in, but I think it's been uh, already quite a length, good length of time. And uh, James has given us that uh, wonderful time. It has been a very, very good learning session and everyone is um, appreciating it. A lot of comments are there in the box. So James, I am grateful to you for your kind deliberations. And uh, you know, you have got a lot of fans in India right now. And they will <laughs> ask you to come to India at the RDS location. So yeah, I'm, I'm hoping I'm hoping to come and visit India next year now that the, the pandemic problems are settling down. So I hope that I get to see uh, yeah. as many of you as possible. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you today about this important topic. Uh, and it thank you to, to Dr. Bhattacharya for the invitation. It will be wonderful for us again to meet you in person and listen to you directly face to face and talk to you. So with this, I want to wrap up today's uh, Palmocon session. And I'm grateful. I express my heartfelt gratitude to James and uh, to Dr. Raja and all my colleagues who have attended this particular session. There is a whooping response. Uh, everyone has enjoyed it. And with that, I invite you all for the next session. I'll be reaching you with email and uh, WhatsApp messages for the next issue of um, Palmocon on severe asthma. So with this, thank you very much once again. Thank you, James. Goodbye. Good night. Thank you.